This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Chris. I think it's uh, season five, episode Ya Mama. It's season five, episode 28 of the Chris Abraham Show. And I'm recording here at Penrose Square Park. And spontaneously, someone just started playing music on a Bluetooth speaker, so you'll have that in the background, but you won't have um, a uh, the beautiful sound of of a water feature because the amazing men of the uh, water feature company are working on it. No kids, no water feature. That is a Wednesday thing to do, I guess. It is twelve oh seven on Wednesday, uh, twelve. Uh, July, and my name is Chris Abraham, and I'm just going to talk about stuff today. I think the thing in my biggest brain right now is honor, love, respect, and Godspeed to Milan Kundera. I, like everybody else, think I discovered him uh, from his uh, film when I was a little kid and uh, that is of course uh, you know Unbearable Lightness of Being I think I saw the movie and then I eventually read the book and then I discovered because I was getting into him I discovered his book about French culture and aging and uh, German history and French history and so forth. His amazing book that I read every year uh, by Milan Kundera called Immortality. And I'd really love to read that book en français. Uh, And I have it en français, but I haven't read it yet. I have that and I have uh, L'étranger en français. Um... But it is an amazing book about the absurdity of pursuing immortality. And it's a great lesson for Vladimir Putin. It's a great lesson for John McCain. May you rest in hell. Uh, it's a great, uh, it's great advice for Milan Kundera. And it's certainly a great advice for Donald Trump and uh, Bush Sr. and Bush Jr. And even uh Jimmy Carter, who doesn't seem to pursue immortality at all. Uh, Donald Trump surely was able to uh, attain immortality, but it is the price of him being heralded also as a president with an asterisk, uh, the first president uh, to probably end up incarcerated, uh, the first president of this, the first president of that, and not in any good way. So Biden is totally going to go ahead and in his pursuit of needing to be president is going to uh, be uh, tarred and feathered and humiliated as well in his pursuit, his single hearted pursuit since he was uh, 30 years old in 1824 of his immortality. So God bless you, sweet Um, And another reason I felt kinship towards Milan Kundera is I am a quarter Czechoslovakian. I'm not saying I'm a quarter Czech because when my people came here, uh, or when I was growing up, it was Czechoslovakia. When my people left there, it was the late, mid to late 1800s. Was it Czechoslovakia or was it... uh, something else was it a was it part of the uh, larger republic of uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire because I know that my other quarter is Austro-Hungarian 
And I think they, growing up, my parents were like, you are a quarter Irish, a quarter English, a quarter Czech, and a quarter Hungarian. But actually, my parents tell me that I was seven things. Irish, English, German, Czechoslovakian, Hungarian, and Austrian. So, um, Irish, English, Czechoslovakian, Hungarian... I remember seven things, Austrian, German, Irish, English, German, Czechoslovakian, Hungarian. Anyway, I used to say seven things, but maybe it's five or six or four. It's very confusing because a lot of my things, Austrian and German and Hungarian and Czechoslovakian, are all Austro-Hungarian things. So I can just say that I'm half English. Turns out, I can also I, maybe I can say that since my pop pop was judge, I think he might have been Irish Catholic because he was Catholic. So maybe judge isn't an English name. So maybe I'm just basically half Irish and half Austro-Hungarian. I don't know. So, God rest you in peace, sweet Milan Kundera. I shall always now read your book, Immortality, every year with the goal of reading your novel in its original French? Was it written in French or written in Czech? I assume it was written in French because it was, it, yes, I believe so. Anyway, the next thing is uh, uh, Tucker Carlson published episode 9 of his Tucker Carlson on Twitter series of videos. And this one was an interview uh, with um, uh, Andrew Tate. And it was fascinating. It was a fascinating interview with Andrew Tate. It was two and a half hours. And every 10 minutes, Andrew Tate said, I will not kill myself. I would never kill myself. I won't kill myself. So he took the Jeffrey Epstein approach, which is to constantly say, in many cases, I think a lot of controversial people include that in what they were talking about. But it was so worthwhile. I'll include a link to it um, via Twitter and via... I'll find it on Bumble and I'll find it on YouTube and I'll find other people posting it. That was fun. So it was pretty intense. Like it was just an amalgam of the best of Andrew Tate, right? Like it went into his accusations. It said how um, he mentioned the Matrix a lot. He calls the Matrix uh, basically the global deep, deep state. Says that it's similar to um, America's concept of the deep, deep, straight, deep state or the establishment bureaucracy or maybe the elite. He said that while he has a, an American and a British passport, he knew that when his name as an enemy of the state and enemy of the people entered into um, uh, British politics, that uh, he was short and he was short for this world. He was going to be, um, he said there's three lives for someone as countercultural like him. He said the first one is, is canceled. The second one is jailed and the third one is killed. So, um, he's been jailed. So that's why he wants us to know that, uh, Jeffrey Epstein did not kill himself, did not hang himself. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, he goes into concepts that he, of course, didn't, he's not even, he said, he's not even actually technically being insult, uh, um, um, accused in the accusations, technically speaking. Um, he used the lover boy method to charm these women into doing TikToks and took their money. So there was no pedophilia, no prostitution, no trafficking is in traveling cross-country borders. There was no um, assault. 
There was no sell, buying and selling of, of human bodies, um, etc. So who knows what's going to happen there. He said he's still going to live in Romania. He says that he's still going to be a uh, talking story with young men to teach them how to attain uh, masculine excellence. And his definition of masculine excellence, I believe, is fivefold, which is you need to have an excellent body. You need to have an excellent mind. You have to have excellent hustle. You need to realize that the beautiful women of your village are now in competition with uh, the rich men of the entire world and that your pretty girl in your village is now able to be invited by a billionaire to his yacht in, uh, in the so on the south of France and that um, instead of being instead of be, needing to be less competitive as a man because there's so much of a larger choice in the world it's now in the same way that your job is what you do and might have had unique uh, opportunity to do in a small market is now because of offshore uh, and you now have to compete with everybody in the world over being an SEO um, technician or a technical SEO expert or whatever I am. You're competing with everybody. You're competing with Philippines and Romanians and, and Vietnam. You're competing with Russians and Ukrainians. You're competing with um, Indians and Bangladeshis. You're competing with ChatGPT and AI. You're competing with SaaS services, um, etc. So the same thing with beautiful people or people of excellence. So you need to get a six-pack. You need to work harder and longer than anybody else. You need to become a gentleman. You need to pursue um, interests and in being interesting because being beautiful isn't enough. You need to become de facto a renaissance man with a six-pack. You need to pursue traditional male roles on a global scale because it's not just America, uh, Western Europe, and, and, and Great Britain anymore. And at the end of the day, uh, the moment any famine comes, the moment any manifestation comes, uh, the value will always go back to the dangerous man who can kill to protect you. Um, we forget that the only reason the genders are equal at the moment is because we live in an extremely safe police state. And if the police state ever, um, ever collapses, uh, it'll be back to hitting people on their head and dragging them into, um, in back to the cave. Um, while uh, it might be important, and this is all according to, um, to Andrew Tate, because honestly, I'm an it, it's, it's pronoun. Like, I want to protect a woman as much as a fish needs to ride a bicycle. So, while I'm extremely dangerous and armed and big and fearsome, and I found out yesterday that my best friend Mark actually is surprised that I haven't killed anybody yet. Um, and apparently those are vibes that I give away, which I think I probably intentionally try to um, smile and giggle and be goofy and accessible and sweet and charming because I have a fear that I am in fact... Um, dangerous. Like every time in my life that anybody's touched me, I've devastated them, even if it was just play. So that hasn't happened too much because maybe I telegraphed that kind of energy. But uh, you guys tell me, like, are you hiding from me that all y'all are fucking scared of me? Or have you fallen for the yuck, 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 goofy, uh, silly old guy routine? Because that's what I'm constantly putting out. I want children to smile at me. I want people to smile at me. 
I want old ladies to think I'm fun. I want cute baristas to call me Chrissy with no intention of any going anywhere. I want to be as, I want to be as most, I want to be not just mostly harmless, like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but I want to be completely harmless. I want to live a gray man, gay man life. Um, I have always told women and ex-girlfriends and women I'm sleeping with who have boyfriends, I've always told them to please, inter- please inter- oh, tell everybody that I'm your gay upstairs neighbor. I'm always happy, always happy to be completely innocuous and, and, um, and it's not that I want to be underestimated. I don't want to be estimated at all. I'm not dating anybody. I'm not secretly dating anybody. I'm not double secretly sneaking around. I'm not a tomcat. I'm not uh, a bifurcated guy who sneaks around getting strange and going to sex parties. No, I'm basically what I always wanted not to be, which is pretty much a capitalist monk choir boy. So based on that, based on pretty much being a dangerous capitalist monk choir boy, um, I really need to get my CCW back. Anyway, on that note, uh, what else? Oh yeah, Milan Kunder died, Andrew Tate, in, and, um, and Tucker Carlson really got along swimmingly. Uh, do you think Tucker Carlson is completely unprincipled or completely principled? And do you think that uh, Tucker Carlson actually incessantly agreed with Andrew Tate? because those are his principles and his beliefs? Or do you believe that Tucker Carlson was appeasing and, and chameleoning and intentionally drawing out Andrew Tate so that the, so that the conversation would continue? I personally think that, uh, I personally think that Tucker Carlson and he completely believe in traditional marriage, traditional relationship. I believe that the things that have blown up a couple of my relationships is uh, body count. Um, I don't want body count to be an issue in a relationship. Uh, Just assume it's because I'm extremely thin-skinned, insecure, uh, Catholic schoolboy, and that I have internalized virgin and whore complex. Um, I just assume it's, it's, um, this issue I have with being madly in love with, uh, Jesus's mom, Mary and Madame Pele and wanting to incessantly, I desperately go out of my way. I spent most of my energy when the relationship goes from being just lovers or friends to being boyfriend, girlfriend, or pre-engaged. I go from being chillax, whatever to um, incessantly trying to put that woman up on a pedestal, no matter how much on a pedestal she doesn't want to be. Um, It's a real issue, which is why I am not in the market for anybody or anything. I'm barely in the market for friends, Jesus. Anyway, um, don't tell anybody I'm dangerous. I don't want anybody to know how many how many folding knives I have on my body at any one time, or how many uh, saps or garrots or pistols or knives or um, uh, tactical pens or whatever that I'm completely covered in. Don't tell anybody. Keep it an incredible secret. Hide my gray manness. Um, what else? I don't know. Um, this morning... Uh, oh, yeah, I also uh, checked on the RT and Sputnik today, and it was really fun uh, to see what's going on there with regards to discovering how much a part of Ukraine the the uh, CIA was and the State Department and, and how um, they found all kinds of, you know, um, color revolutionary instruction manuals and various and sundry apartments in Lithuania and 
all these other things, all the other color revolution playbooks, all the fundings, all the influence by the agencies and the NGOs. It's just really fun. Oh, and another thing is um, someone was talking about COVID, and I don't care about COVID. I mean, I ended up getting the J&J, and that's my only shot because... Um, I actually thought that someone at some point was going to ask me for my passport. So I'm like, I'm on so many blood thinners right now that if I get the J&J, there's zero chance of me getting uh, blood, blood, uh, you know, uh, issues with, uh, with blood clumps or whatever they're called. Um, and the chance of me stroking out is negligible. So I got that and I considered myself one and done. And then I basically, now that I have the passport, I basically ignored the best wishes of all my doctors and just, you know, but that's, that doesn't say that I'm anti-vaccine. I totally took, uh, the, um, flu vaccine and I, I took the first shot of the, um, chicken pox vaccine, the, uh, um, I'm probably sterile now because I never got chicken pox growing up. So now maybe I never got the second one. I need to talk to my doc about that. Um, what else? Oh, so here's the thing. Nobody listen. Nobody, as we all know, nobody checks to see. So here's a strategy for everything, right? Um, you need to be convinced today that the war in Ukraine is not only more moral and ethical, but for the reason of saving democracy. You need to believe today that the war in Iraq was noble. And you need to believe it really hard right now. You need to believe that the, uh, the war in Afghanistan was because literally a bunch of terrorists uh, flew airplanes into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and... Uh, WTC seven won't go away. You need to believe all that now. And then I was listening to someone who's like, well, yeah, um, we totally, you know, believe that at first the, um, the COVID shot was going to stop getting it. It was going to stop transmission. Then it was going to stop getting it. Then, uh, it was not going to stop transmission. And then it was going to stop you from getting it, but it was probably going to exacerbate transmission. And then it doesn't stop you from getting it, but it reduces uh, the severity. And then they're like, it doesn't reduce the severity, but it reduces the chance of dying. And then they might even say right now that it doesn't work at all. And it was a failed attempt because of how quickly the virus mutates. And then they come and say, well, all the truth eventually came out. We didn't know the truth at first. And the truth eventually comes out. And so the truth is out now, isn't it? But that doesn't change the fact that the strategy works. As long as you can go ahead and make people have um, uh, derangement syndrome, as long as you can get them to have derangement sy syndrome, as for as long as it takes to spend all the money and check all of your tasks off in terms of uh, hegemony or power or control or, or, um, or earnings or even things like stopping, like we should be in a recession now, but because of the, because of all the, uh, amazing wars and so forth, like our, um, and because of all, all the fun stuff that's going on globally, like during World War II and everything, um, I'll be honest with you that war has probably been really good uh, to stop uh, the commercial real estate collapse, to stop uh, the collapse of, of, uh, of, of the market, to, to bolster the market, to bolster people in the market. Um, probably all these things were ultimately good. You know, the war in Ukraine was probably good for that. The, um, and as a result, a lot of these things can definitely abate uh, depressions and recessions. So I don't care about international hegemonic imperialism. I just want some transparency. I mean, 
if we're going to be worse than uh, Bibi Netanyahu, at least be as baller about it, right? Like, I don't know. Bibi Netanyahu gives no fucks. Um, and I don't even know what the, you know, like, I don't even know. Like, there was a video this morning talking about Foucault's views on on uh, pedophilia and age of consent and all this other stuff and the definition of uh, of, of of queer scholars and trans scholars being uh, from the world of of, uh, of age of consent pedophiliacs and all that stuff I don't know about any of that stuff I know that in Hawaii I think that when I was a kid the age of consent was 13 or 14. I know that the age of consent in Japan until recently was 13 years old. Um, I don't know. I feel like I like, I like adult women and I like adult women a lot. And I like curvy adult women a lot. I don't like boys with breasts and I'm not into boys and I'm not into little girls, uh, ever. Um, and even curvy, you know, 30-something and 40-something-year-old women, I only appreciate at a distance. So I'm out of that market completely. But it's what I find telling is that uh, it's sort of like, you know, with, with, um, with uh, any of our heroes, right? Like if, we, if I were to find out that Milan Kundera was a pedophile... Would I stop reading his books? You know, Woody Allen. Uh, would I stop reading his, watching his movies or reading his articles? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that, does that definition change my complete concept of the art they offer, the writings they made, and so forth? For me, no, because I'm, um, I'm a uh, Jacques Derrida Derridian. I believe there's nothing beyond the text. I believe that the importance of the text, the art, the text meaning any type of content, the text, the art, the photograph, the movie, the series, the YouTube, the TikTok or whatever. I believe that there's nothing beyond the text. I believe that the name of the author and the photo of the author and the bio of the author are irrelevant to the importance of the text. Um... And I even, so, but it's something that uh, the trans movement and the queer movement and the gay movement is going to have to address eventually. At some point, the anti, um, anti-pedo right and center and religious right and religious center and all the other world, including um, traditional gay LGBTQ people, uh, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, etc. Everybody is going to finally uh, weaponize this and they're going to be able to paint uh, all of L, all of G, all of B, all of T, all of Q, all of I, all of A all of plus plus as being, um, pedos are being, you know, uh, and not, uh, and, and, and then, um, there'll be a blanket, a, a blanket phobia, a blanket phobia that will take in the lesbians and gays and bi's as well. It will be weaponized and everybody in the LGBTQIA++ will get sucked into the, into the swamp, into the tar pit, into the sand, what is it called, um, uh, get cut in the sand pit, you know, like, uh, um, um, and they will be sucked under, you know, it'll, it's just like exactly when Black Lives Matter was dismissed as not only a grift, but also um, so, uh, peopled by trained Marxists, right? There's the same people who are completely mental about uh, fighting and killing Nazis in Ukraine 
um, and fighting and killing Putin and and supporting Ukraine against uh, Russia and everybody who's living out World War II again, everybody who bought into the first programming of anti-communism, better dead than red, uh, anti-pinko, uh, the first McCarthyism, all those people who are still alive and being activated against against Russia in this sort of Cold War redux are going to be the same people who all of a sudden are like, nope, they're like, nope, and everybody comes down. You know, you could be, uh, you could be a twink into bears. You can be, uh, um, you could be, um, you could be, you know, uh, um, a lesbian into milfs. You could be whatever. You could be a bi into like, um, beautiful, uh, gray foxes, right? Like, but you are going to be taken down into just being a variation of a pedophile. And I don't know where this is going to end. It's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful weaponization and it is going to use all the stratagem and all the strategies and all the strategy that, um, the left has been using against, right-wing pastors and Catholics. They can just open up the anti, anti-priest, uh, anti-conservative Christian pastor playbook and play all of those games and use them against the, uh, um, anybody who is uh, a, a queer intellectual or queer scholar. So that's coming. And because there are so many now uh, conservative scholars who don't have degrees, but they consider themselves scholars because they listen to whoever the fuck, um, Joe Rogan, uh, Jimmy Dore, uh, um, whatever the guy is from Canada, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I'm a huge ally of the uh, LGBTQ community, and I feel like over the last, over the next, uh, over the next three years, there's going to be a concerted uh, effort of reducing the entire community, including trans, gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, non-binary, gay. Can reduce you all to to uh, a former. Uh, you're going to be all dismissed as mentally ill degenerates, and all the words that were used 50 years ago to define LGBTQ++, IA++, as uh, degenerate, mentally ill, are going to be reactivated now as a result of finding out about Foucault and about, is it Ruben? Like, there's a bunch of names that I don't know, but, like, all the people who have defined, who invented queer studies, who are the top queer studies activists... Um, Foucault, who started postmodernism. I bet you Deleuze. I bet you um, Derrida. I bet you Ellen Sixou. I bet you there's so many people who you're going to be able to find um, stuff about age of consent, stuff about uh, child sexuality, um, uh, stuff about the ability for young kids, as long as they can consent, can pursue love relationships with adults, and all those other things. And this is a this is a guarantee. Uh, the reason why uh, that movie, um, oh, what the hell is the name of the movie? Whatever the movie that's out right now that I'm probably going to see on Saturday afternoon. Uh, that's that's about uh, child trafficking and child abduction and everything. I guarantee you that that is the that is the. Uh, the tip of the iceberg. That's the tipping point. Uh, the reason why everybody's totally freaking out is once you can dismiss as uh, everybody as a grotesque caricature of the only thing that gets people immediately killed in jail, which is being a child molester. Uh, once the entire LGBTQIA++ community gets smeared, and, and, and fully hit by a uh, hypersonic missile of morality once they get sunk 
by a, uh, a space laser. And uh, once the boat goes all the way down, um, it's going to be really awful. It's gonna, there's going to be so much backlash against everybody in the alphabet, LGBTQIA+. Um, and I hope it's not war. I hope it's not... I hope it's not war, man. Like, I live in Northern Virginia. I live in the D.C. area. Like, gosh. There, uh, so many... So many non-binary. So many trans. So many uh, gay. So many lesbian. So many bisexual. So many pansexual. So many polyamorous friends. Oh my God, I can't even. So... Good luck. I don't know what is going to happen. Uh, the only reason I think that it's really dangerous is because I saw this whole thing being exposed on Tim Pool this morning. You know, it's... Uh, and I know that Tim Pool has millions and millions and millions of, quote, red pill, quote, black pill, quote, you know, Christo-fascist watchers, right? He is a leftist populist, but he really appeals to the rightist populist world. And so, before you know it, this is going to become common knowledge. And if it hasn't been before, because I didn't know it until today. And I've read, you know, Ellen Sixu, I've read Deleuze, I've read Foucault, I've read Derrida, you know, I've read um, black lesbian feminists, I've read I've read Marxist feminist theory. I've read African American theory. I've read Marx and Engels. I've read Marx and Engels. I've read Marx satire. I've met, read his history. Like shit, I'm pretty inculcated, and I just never knew there was this whole, um, um, you know, child, uh, child love. Uh, what is it? Uh, perception of the the autonomy of children and the agency of children who are, you know, really young and the fact that, uh, and all this other stuff. I'm dismissing it. I'm, I'm failing to consider it more than just slander. And uh, the beginning of the uh, response messaging to define and defile the LGBTQ community as just uh, degenerate um, uh, demons. I think it even goes as far as to dismiss the entire group as, as demonic, as anti, like as literally Luciferian Satanists. Because I keep on forgetting we live in a world that strongly believes in the forces of good and evil as being real and that, and that uh, Satan fell, uh, was sent away from heaven for his... Uh, for his vanity and he and all of his demons and all of his other fallen angels are here to to win the world of man away from the world of God and all that fun stuff so take that into consideration too it's gonna be really dangerous anyway I'm done now I hope no, nobody listens to this because it's probably gonna get me canceled but I am an ally I am a friend uh, I need to is it still something where if you put a, um, a, uh, uh, what is it called? A diaper pin on your bag or on your clothes or whatever? A safety pin. Is it still the signifier that if you wear a safety pin on your body or on your bag, it means that you're a safe place? Is that still a thing? Anyway, love you guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed listening. If you think this is long, don't think it's long because, to be honest, it is not two and a half hours. And even I thought the interview was with uh, between Tucker Carlson and um, Andrew Tate was interminable and endless. Love you guys. Don't forget to share me, like me, five star me, enjoy me, subscribe to me, all that other fun stuff. Talk to you soon. Oh, and contact me via all my socials because I would love it if you have any questions for me to answer or make topics of my little uh, uh, few times a week rants. I'll talk to you soon. Love you. Bye-bye.
Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.